Hi, this is the second part of my video on building a simple PCB using Easy EDA. In this video, we'll be taking a look at how to use a solder stencil, placing SMD components, and soldering using simple kitchen equipment, and also how to fix up your mistakes. Good uh, advert for my sponsor, but I'm really stuck. What's your sponsor? JLC PCB. So what have you got so far? Well, you know my chips gag. I do indeed. I was going to ride in on a Harley, uh, looking really cool, and say... Wait a second, what's a Harley got to do with PCBs? <sighs> well... How about this? Okay, you have a shot of the kitchen. Mum's in there wondering why one of her plants is dying, and says, Oh gosh darn, why is my plant dying? I wish I had some electronics to save the day. Then you appear wearing a green superhero costume with a JLC PCB logo on it and say, what seems to be the problem, citizen? And mum says, oh, JLC PCB man, you're my superhero. You're kidding me. You want me to wear a green superhero suit and I'm called JLC PCB man. Well, I'm, I'm fresh out of ideas. Yeah, well, thanks. If you watched part one of this video, you would have seen me design a simple PCB using Easy EDA. This board I'll soon be selling on Tindy, so unlike my MM board, which was a total April Fool's joke, this one is for real. Building boards by hand is a very time-consuming task. If you have more than four boards to make and have access to a pick-and-place machine, then that way it will be a whole lot faster. However, since I'm only building four boards, it's faster to do it by hand. So the package arrived pretty quickly. In fact, I placed the order on a Friday and the package arrived on Monday afternoon. Of course, Easy EDA knew who I was, but my take on it is if they can do it once, they can do it again. I didn't find any issues at all with the PCBs and was pretty impressed with the accuracy of the silk screen printing. If you check out EEV blog forums, they say pretty much the same thing. With this batch of PCBs, I ordered 10 panelized PCBs. Panelizing is a way of getting more for the same cost. The reason for this is, you will pay the same cost for any board size up to 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. So if your board is say 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters, then placing four boards within that area won't cost you any more. Easy EDA offer a free paneling service. So you just select the layout and you're good to go. I also ordered a stencil. This costs extra, but as you'll see in this video, if you're doing a number of boards, you really can't do without it. So let's get stuck into building the boards by hand. To build the boards, you'll of course need all the parts available. You'll also need a list of parts, bunched and sorted by package height. You want to be able to place the smaller components first, otherwise you risk bumping things. Next, crack out the stencil. What is a stencil, you ask? Well, the stencil is used to apply a very thin layer of solder paste to the PCB. First, you need to carefully remove it from the backing plate. I ordered an unframed stencil. If you order a frame around it, it'll cost more, but is sturdier. You need to treat these stencils very carefully. If you have any bend in them, they'll be effectively useless. So, there are several rules when using stencils. One, treat them like they are made of tissue paper. Two, always keep them clean before and after use. You can use isopropanol for this. Three, when not in use, keep them secure in the backing. Four, did I mention always keep them clean? Once you have your stencil cleaned up, you'll need to stick down some holders that hold the PCB in place. Remember, you're dealing with fractions of a millimeter here, so it needs to be secure. Also, make sure that the PCB is stuck down, otherwise it might lift up when you remove the stencil. Next, arrange a bunch of spare PCBs around the place. This avoids the stencil warping when you press down on it. Then spend some time lining up the stencil with the pads. The easiest way is to pick the largest hole first and roughly line things up. Then pick a smaller package, ideally an MCU, to fine tune it. Next, tape down the corners securely. You don't want that thing moving one fraction of a millimeter. Next is the messy bit. Of course, you'll need some solder paste. I used this solder paste, which is a lead-free variant. It basically means that you won't kill yourself slowly with lead poisoning, which is always a good thing. 
The other good thing about this solar paste is that it can stay on the boards for up to eight hours without drying up. That's plenty of time to get these boards loaded and soldered. The process is pretty simple. Apply solder paste to the edge of a card so that you have a nice even line. Credit cards work well as they are rigid with a bit of flexibility. But you really should use a card that is bigger than the PCB and only make one pass over the board. The reason for this is that the stencil doesn't really lie completely flat. When you apply solder paste, the stencil can move up slightly as you pass over. As it moves up, it can produce a small vacuum that sucks solder back onto the board. When you pass over it again, the stencil pushes that bit down onto the PCB. The problem only gets worse the more passes you make. And once you have solder paste underneath the stencil, things go from bad to worse. And you'll just have to stop, clean both the PCB and stencil, and start all over again. Next you'll need to remove the stencil very carefully. Any slight movement and you'll mess up the solder. For example, the second batch of boards I made this mistake. See that tiny movement? It completely stuffed everything up. If you do this, you'll need to thoroughly clean both the PCB and stencil and start all over again. After you've removed the stencil, visually inspect to make sure everything is okay. Then clean up, pack away any spare solder back into the container, set aside the PCBs you've pasted and clean up the stencil. You don't want any dry solder paste stuffing things up later. Next is the painstaking bit, picking and placing components. The larger, flatter components are relatively easy. Most of the parts were thankfully only 0603s. 0603 refers to the SMD package size. You can work with 0603s fairly easily, but you can also get the smaller 0402. And things get a little crazy when you get down to 0201s. There's even a 008004 standard, which comes in at a 0.2mm by 0.1mm package. Of course, some parts can be placed in any orientation. Resistors and most capacitors can be placed rotated, upside down or right side up. But the package has really been designed to be placed with the label at the top. You can flip them around easily like this, but be careful as they can end up flying across the room. And forget ever trying to find even a 603. The amount of solder paste is also important. This is the perfect amount of solder. Whereas in other areas on this board, there were large spread out blobs. This was because I made several passes with the solder screeder. It's not a huge drama, but it will more than likely increase your time fixing up solder bridges. You'll discover later how this can affect the final result. Try to firmly place components down vertically. If you come in from the side, you risk pushing solder paste all around. This is often hard to do, especially with a shaky hand. When placing MCUs, it's pretty important to line up accurately. The more the pins line up with the pads, the less chance there will be for solder bridges. Of course, these need to be placed with the correct orientation. Along with things like buzzers and LEDs. Back in weekly roundup number 47, we saw the LED Twee Kickstarter. Essentially a pair of tweezers with a battery that tell you the correct LED orientation. They come in handy with this sort of thing. Once you have your PCB fully loaded, it's off to the cooker. This is called reflow. There's several different methods, but they all involve heating up the board to around 190 to 210 degrees Celsius. You can use an infrared reflow oven, a reflower, commercial nitrogen reflowers, expensive vapor phase ovens, or just crack out your electric fry pan. A fry pan with a thermistor attached is good enough for the job. If you saw my reflow review video, you'll have heard me and my mate Keen talk about temperature profiles. You can't just slap heat onto a PCB and expect it to solder. There's a thing called thermal shock, and it can damage components and cause badly soldered joints. So you need to reflow according to a correct temperature profile. It turns out that the humble fry pan has a mostly accurate temperature profile, just by turning it on until solder melts, and then turn off when done. The only downside is that not all the fry pan heats up evenly, so using a pokey stick to prod it occasionally helps. Note that as soon as I push down in one area, the PCB makes contact with the fry pan and then the solder melts. So there's several things happening here. Let's rewind and watch it again. 
you'll see here that too much solder was placed on the PCB, but as the solder starts to melt, it is drawn into itself. This is due, thankfully, to surface tension. Without it, the whole electronics industry would be very different. However, sometimes it doesn't always work out like that, and incorrectly placed components can cause solar bridges. And some of the larger components don't even reflow at all. Using a fry pan is useful because sometimes components tombstone, and you can poke them down with a stick. Tombstoning is where the surface tension of the solder lifts up a component vertically. Sadly, it never happened for me this time. It's important not to leave it there for too long, so turn it off and keep the PCB in there until it cools down. This is where the thermistor comes in. Around 50 to 60 degrees should be good enough. Fixing up solar bridges is easy enough. A bit of flux and solder wick cleans things up pretty quickly. Now that you have your board all soldered up, time to program it. My super duper PCB is based on a SAMD21. If you want to know how to flash a bootloader for the Arduino IDE, or just simply roll your own code from scratch, then check out two of my videos on this that'll have you up and running in a couple of minutes. If you want to make your own boards, then I highly recommend using Easy EDA to design it, and then ordering the PCBs through their sister company, JLC PCB. You can't go past the offer of getting 10 PCBs for only $2, and at the moment they are offering a $20 shipping discount on your first order. So there you have it, you now have everything to make your own PCBs from scratch. Thanks for watching and see you next week. No, just act normal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> act normal. Oh, JLC PCB. <laughs> Dude.